We'd like to welcome everyone to the January 26th meeting of the Newburn Board of Aldermen. The prayer tonight will be given by Alderwoman Harris. Thank you, Mayor. Can we have everybody bow their head? Father God, we come to you and we just ask that we continue to do the business of the city. We continue to pray to those that are all have been affected or um, struggling with COVID-19. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in the pledge of allegiance to the flag of our country? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Alderman Dingle, here. Alderwoman Harris, present. Alderman Astor, here. Mayor Outlaw, here. Alderman Kinsey? Here. Alderman Bess? Present. Alderman Adam? Here. Okay, our first item of business tonight will be the consent agenda. Mayor, I'll make a motion we approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion and second. Is there a discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? All opposed to saying? Motion carries. Um, item number 10, Mr. Stevens. Thank you, Mayor. Item number 10, uh, yeah, I'm going to turn it over to our city attorney, uh, Mr. Davis. He wants to introduce our new assistant attorney uh, working with the city attorney on uh, functions that he performs for the city uh, throughout uh, the year. Uh, Mayor, members of the board, um, it is my great pleasure to introduce you this evening to the newest member of Davis Hartman Wright, um, Jamie Bullock Mosley who will be working with me um, on your behalf and on the behalf of your Planning and Zoning Board, your Historic Preservation Commission, your Board of Adjustment, and your Redevelopment Commission. Jamie's story, in my mind at least, begins back in 2013 when I was sitting in Mike Epperson's office and Mike was begging me to find an attorney to help with our committees. Um, it's a job that I did when I first started, when I had a mentor to work with, A.D. Ward. Um, and I did that for many, many years. But there comes a day where you simply can't be at every single meeting of the city, as each of you well know. Um, and we found that those boards and committees were getting quite robust and having challenging issues. And I would go as needed, but sometimes you don't always know when you're needed until it's too late. So I sincerely started in 2013 looking for someone to be the new younger me. And I wanted someone from New Bern like me. My predecessor, A.D. Ward, who served in this capacity for over 40 years, was from New Bern. So uh, I was very intent on maintaining that tradition for a number of reasons. One, obviously it helps to, to be from here and know people to help you solve problems. But as I jokingly tell people, the bigger reason is when you do this in front of your family and your friends, there is nothing that motivates you like not wanting to fail in front of your family and friends. So you approach the position with a whole lot of effort to avoid that. So as the years went by, I would sit right there and I would listen to every lawyer that came up to address you. I would take note of all the new young lawyers that I would meet, and for years no one met the standards until about this time last year, I think, when you folks had uh, a presentation uh, from the Redevelopment Commission. And I sat there, and it was like one of those uh, music uh, game shows on TV where at the time, Jimmy Bullock was standing here, and she was making a presentation, and my back's to the speaker, and I thought, wow, this young lady is doing a very nice job. And the further she went on, the better she did. You probably don't remember this, but a number of you had very challenging questions for her with a, a bit of pushback, and um, she just handled it beautifully. To the point where afterward, I asked city manager, who is that young lady? I, I, don't, I don't know who she is. And he said, well, it's Jimmy Bullock. And I'm like, well, I know the name. What does she do? And he said, well, she's a lawyer. I said, well, perfect. I'm going to be her new best friend. <laughs> So uh, I reached out to her literally the next morning, I think at 8 o'clock. And, uh, and to make a long, long story short, here we are after a year. So I'm, I'm terribly excited to have her with our firm. 
I'm very excited um, to have her with our boards. We've been making our rounds. Uh, we started in early January. We've been to Planning and Zoning. We've been to the Historic Preservation Commission, um, the Redevelopment Commission, and we will ultimately hit the Board of Adjustment. Um, I will tell you that those boards are thrilled and relieved to have an attorney sitting with them for their meetings. It's a great resource to have. They are very appreciative. Um, I'm talking like we all know Jamie, and I think we all do, but for those who don't know Jamie, she is from New Bern. She went to school here, a graduate of New Bern High School, like many of us. Um, she's also a Tar Heel. She went to school with Chapel Hill, near and dear to my heart. She thereafter went on to North Carolina Central University and has been here with Green, Wilson, and Crow for the last five years practicing criminal law, which is to say this. She is going to be working with our boards and commissions. She's going to work her way through this process um, with me. Um, I have very high expectations for her, but this is a job that takes time to, to understand, right? Um, um, I'm very comfortable with her, with our boards and commissions. Um, she's been studying very hard. I've given her lots to do and lots to think about. She always has me as a resource. Um, but I just want to, I don't want to put too much pressure on her because this is a learning process. As I tell people, it takes five years to become not dangerous and 10 years to get pretty good at this. So in month one, we need to give her a little space and let her, <laughs> let her uh, grow into the position. So with that said, Jamie, why don't you just say one brief word to the board and I will sit down. Mr. Mayor, members of the board, first I want to thank you for the opportunity for me to serve my community where I grew up, where my family lives in this capacity. I'm also thankful to Mr. Davis for his confidence in me and extending me this opportunity. And I also want to thank my family, uh, many of which are in internet land, um, but my parents are on the front row, uh, Pastor James and Mrs. Gail Bullock, um, who have supported me and encouraged me throughout this process. And my very best friend, Aisha Durham, who has um, been a, my biggest supporter next to my parents and my husband um, throughout my entire career. I look forward to serving you and I'm thankful for this opportunity to serve the citizens of Newburgh. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I know some of the Auburn probably want to make comments. I, I just want to thank you, Jamie, for what you've done so far, the Redevelopment Commission in particular. And uh, as Mr. Davis says, I have had an honor and privilege to see you in action making presentations that you do a great job. I would just want to say welcome, Jamie. We're so glad to have you. And of course, um, I'm so glad to see your parents. Um, I still, my first thought of you is running down the aisle at St. Paul's School at the church there when you were a little, little girl, um, your brother in school with my son, and just knowing how wonderful your family is and what an asset you are to this community. And I'm so grateful to have you and work with you. And I look forward uh, to a long tenure with, with Scott in our city. Jamie, I have to say, I've been knowing your father since I was a little kid. He's been a very good friend of mine and your mom. And I remember when you first started your job working during the summer, working your way through school. And I remember asking you, what were you going to become? You said, an attorney. And we have arrived. Congratulations. Um, Ms. Bullock Mosley, I just want to say welcome aboard. Um, it, it's a pleasure to, to know you and to know where you, your background, where you come from. You come from such a fine family, so I, I can't expect nothing but the best out of you. And as Attorney Davis said, it's a learning process. It's going to take time. And I say that to say this, just like this right here was a learning process for me, and it takes time. So I know we'll all be patient with you and understanding. and. Welcome aboard, young lady. Jamie, I'll just say ditto sitting on this end. That's usually what happens. Everybody says what I'd like to say. But um, <laughs> I, I do think it's great that um, a fellow New Bernian that came up through the system is here. And I think that uh, that certainly means a lot. But Scott, I did have one question for you. When you started with AD Ward, how long was it before AD retired? Uh, let me think. Um, I started in 92. It was uh, nine years. Okay. Yeah. 
So she's got nine years, and you're going to be on a beach somewhere surfing? That's that the plan. Time? Yes, sir. That's the grand plan. Yeah, if it all comes together. Exactly. Uh, and Mr. Mayor, I, I, I want to say one last thing, and I want to extend, Jamie, this courtesy that I did not get from, from A.D. Ward. Um, when I started the position, no one gave me a title. Right? I, I, it finally, after about three or four years, I finally just started calling myself the assistant city attorney. So uh, from here going forward, with your permission, I'm going to be referring to Jamie as the assistant city attorney so there's no confusion going forward. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you for coming on board with us. Anybody else at this time? It's good. I'm number 11. Thank you, Mayor. Um, item number 11, as you recall, uh, at our previous meeting uh, we had in January, um, we held a public hearing for uh, potential rezoning of 3498 Martin Drive. Um, at that time, um, the statutorily, our meeting was considered to be a re remote meeting and the board was required to provide a 24-hour period of submission for comments, uh, written comments, uh, for the public to uh, make any kind of, uh, of, of comments or raise any questions to or against uh, um, this particular uh, rezoning. During that 24-hour period, we did receive one letter of comment that's included in your packet tonight. Uh, what we're asking of the board tonight is uh, to consider um, whether or not they wish to rezone this property. If they do, uh, you will need to first adopt a statement of zoning consistency or inconsistency, basically stating whether or not this, uh, this zoning is consistent with and congruous with the area. And then if you choose to move forward with the statement of zoning consistency, then you will need to approve the ordinance to rezone 3498 Martin Drive. Uh, so as a reminder, this property uh, is owned by MMJH LLC, requested to rezone the 2.36 acre parcel at 3498 Martin Drive from I-2 to I-1. Planning and Zoning Board unanimously approved this at their December 1st meeting and all of the relevant information that was presented to you at our previous meeting is also included in the packet. We have staff here to answer any questions and I believe the owner is here as well. I have a question of the attorney. Uh, Mr. Davis, are there parcels of property in New Bern that are landlocked that are zoned? Yes, sir. And does zoning have any um, conform, I mean, does the zoning an issue when it comes to being landlocked or having access? No, sir. Zoning is simply um, uh, a, uh, a use that is applied to property through our land use ordinance. So if a property in question, uh, if it is question legal or, or whatever about egress, ingress, or redress, then um, is the, are any of the elected officials in any way non-compliant with their oath of office to, to change a zoning based on anything having to do with uh, No, with that's right. Again, z zoning has nothing to do with the rest of the land use ordinance or accessibility or anything. Um, you may have noticed, in fact, in prior rezonings, you might recall that we've even had portions of property rezoned. In fact, you've got one coming up, I think, a little bit later. Um, where a portion of a single track is being rezoned to a different use. And that piece is actually also landlocked. Okay, thank you, mm -hmm. sir. That was my question. If there's any, not any other questions, then I'd like to make a motion that we adopt the statement of zoning consistency for 3498 Martin Drive. Can I do them both at the same time? Yeah. And also uh, adopt the ordinance to rezone 3498 Martin Drive. Second. Motion and second. Is there discussion? Seeing none, let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Odom. Alderman Odom? Yes. Alderman Bess? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Mayor Outlaw? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Alderwoman Harris? Yes. Alderman Dingle? Yes. Motion carries. Item number 13. Yeah, number 12. Well, you did, not, you did 11 and 12, is that right? No, no he just, he just I did, did 11 A and B. A and B if uh, you want I'm to sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Let's go to item number 12. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. Item number 12 is a resolution Sorry to request that, yeah. local legislation to authorize the city of New Bern to charge a fee in lieu of construction for sidewalks required for new developments requiring site plan review. Uh, as we discussed this at our work session on the 5th of January, the proposed resolution asked the North Carolina General Assembly to introduce local legislation to authorize New Bern to charge a fee in lieu of construction for sidewalks required for new developments requiring a site plan. If this is approved, uh, the resolution will also be forwarded to the city's delegates at the North Carolina Senate, North Carolina House of Representatives, and uh, it will also be sent to uh, the, the bill drafting department. Uh, Scott will do that uh, so that they can start begin, uh, the formulation of the, the draft uh, of, of bill uh, to be considered at the state level. So we're happy to answer any questions. There's a memo included from Mr. Ruggieri and uh, Attorney Davis and myself are here answering the questions. Well, um, I... Since this has come up, I, I've, I've looked and pondered and questioned myself on my, as uh, Alderman Best mentioned, the learning curve of, of, of being in office. Um, uh, I have I have inconsistencies on my part trying to figure out when I ride through town and, and the house is built on an infill and it doesn't have to have a, a sidewalk and then other areas do. So I'm I feel like already there's enough inconsistency in um, all the way back to the pedestrian plan of the 2010 period that I'm still, uh, I don't have any absolutes. I think on this particular matter, if um, I were to, to have a, it, it be supporting it, I would be first looking for some absolutes on it being citywide anything that gets an improvement that should have had a sol sidewalk or shouldn't. Um, I, I don't still understand that. Mr. Davis has worked real hard to try to um, help me with that. But um, along those lines, I, I feel like this, this right now until we can refine it is, is a voluntary impact fee. Uh, it's a voluntary impact fee that I still question when the money, if uh, a developer builder decides in lieu of a sidewalk to post the, 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 the fee, whatever, when it's going to get spent somewhere else and how equitable is it going to be for a particular region area of, of New Bern. Um, so again, I still have I have some concerns and questions, and I, uh, I'm not uh, fully supportive of this at this time. That's just to get the ball rolling. If anybody else has any comments. Question, more so than a comment. Um, it, the process would be that we would vote on this tonight, and you would draft some something that would go up to Raleigh. Then they decide if they're going to pass it or not. We don't know at that point if they will it'll come back and I've seen things blow up up there because their legal department gets a hold of it. But then it comes back and then we still work on details, correct? So this isn't the end all be all or is it? It's um, actually better than you're describing. Okay. So <laughs> if, if we get through the gauntlet of the entire process, the end result from the legislature is a law that would allow Newburn to adopt an ordinance to, to, to do the, the fee in lieu of the sidewalk. So this step is asking for what's called an enabling statute, a law that lets us do it. We could get to that point, get the local bill, and never do it. That's what happened in Beaufort with their shoreline, their abandoned vessel. That was done back in the 70s. And for 20 or 30 years, it, that law sat there until they decided to adopt an ordinance under the authority given by that law. So, so the mayor has lots of good questions about the details and the fairness and the process. I totally agree with those questions, but we'll never get to those questions in this process. This process just says, you can do this. Right now, we can't even do it. And you may decide, even with the authority, that you don't want to do it at that point. And I'm, I'm more comfortable with moving ahead and at least going through that process. And it still has to come back to us. We still have to debate it, define it, and do whatever. 
if we so choose. Yes, ma'am. You'll, 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 you'll look at and you'll review the local bill to make sure that we're all happy with it. And then once, once if, if it's adopted at the state level, then at some point down the road, the board would then decide what do you do with it, if anything. Alderman Adam. Um, Scott, maybe you could help. I agree with the mayor that at least throughout my tenure, there's been a lot of inconsistencies. You'll ride down the road, you'll see a new site. It may have a sidewalk. Down the road, a new site doesn't. Did, didn't we fix that in a land use ordinance change a couple years ago where all sidewalks are required? They are, they are. Yes, if you're in that corridor, only for development, um, only for development. You could have a house that it doesn't require. Right. The, the, the trigger, the, the tr there's two triggering events, subdivisions and projects that re require departmental review, which tend to be commercial projects. So there is an odd situation where you could have a single family house um, or, or a small business project that doesn't trigger a subdivision and it doesn't trigger development review, and that, that would not require a sidewalk. A simple remodeling would not require a sidewalk. So to get into the specifics of the solar farm, mm -hmm. is that area part of our bike and pedestrian It plan? is. It is. Really? Yes, it is. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, maybe, that, maybe that's the first problem we should address, but my, my next comment or question, I guess, would be, I understand what this process does. It allows us that flexibility to do something. But at the end of the day, the developer is still going to have that choice to either build it if it's required or pay in money if they don't want to build it. Great, great question. The, what I'm imagining, if we get through this entire right. process, which is not given, but staff and I would be recommending um, a process where staff would be making that call. It's not a developer option. It's a, it's a staff recommendation that this is the better way to do this because it, it makes a lot more sense. So, so now you've raised another concern that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. So I thought all along that this was going to be up to the developer to either put the sidewalk in or pay the money if it's required on that it, site. It could be okay. if that's what the board, if that's the ordinance that the board at that time wants, that can be the answer, absolutely. Right now there is simply no tool. Build your sidewalk. That's, that's the only tool we have. And, and that, the best thinking is that's better than nothing. The worry we have is that decades and decades can go by where we have islands of sidewalks that are degrading and are a blight that connect to nothing. That's the downside with our current ordinance. But yes, and that's where the mayor gets in the weeds with the how's it going to work, and you, you make a great point. It may well be that that's what the board wants to do at that time is have a developer choice. Because what I've been trying to figure out with this whole thing is, staff correct me if I'm wrong, but when we look at bonding information, things like that, the figures that we use to estimate how much it would cost to build a sidewalk is far more than what it actually costs to get it done. So to me, if I'm a developer and you're telling me I've got to have a sidewalk and I look at it, my concrete guy says I'll do it for $3,000, but you, staff says, if you don't want to put it in, you can just pay us 10000 instead. I don't think very often that a, the developer is going to give us money, so I don't even know how relevant this is going to be, to be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, there are going to be times where there is a project that is adjacent to a completed sidewalk, in which case I don't think you'd want the developer to have an option to not build the sidewalk. It's, it's right there, connect to it. Um, in the solar farm case, it's miles and miles from the nearest sidewalk. They've even offered, can we just send you a check and not do this? We'd just be much more happier to give you a check and not have to go hire a contractor and deal with all this. The mechanics of whether it's a good deal or not is a, is a function of the ordinance that would exist in the future. You price, you price it right, and, it, and it's, it should be a wash. Do I build it or do I just pay the city? If it's a wash, it makes sense. But if there's an incentive in either direction, you know, people are not stupid. Yeah, thank you. Well, <clears throat> uh, I know that on the corridor plan of the city, new the pet pedestrian plan, the idea is to have sidewalks on both sides of some of, of our major thoroughfares, Trent Road in particular. I know that the Harris Teeter area has sidewalks on that side, and you don't see a lot of sidewalks anymore on Trent Road. 
to Simmons Street, but then when you get down around Fly Bike Shop, you got a, a lot of them on that side, but not on the Harris Teeter side. So again, I uh, <clears throat> I know that I'm I'm getting ahead of the game here, and I know I understand what you're saying. Just have this available if we want it, but um, I guess what I'm getting to is is are there going to be instances where where the luck of the draw? Uh, an investor buys a piece of property somewhere on one side of the street that doesn't have to have a sidewalk, so he doesn't have to pay the fund, he or she, but if he bought, or he or she bought on the other side where there is sidewalks and you're trying to do the fill-in, they do have to pay the fee. I, I'm not sure I'm following that. Do some people get lucky and some don't with this plan? Uh, not under the current plan and not under the imagined plan. Right now, you have a hard and fast rule. Subdivision, department review, you're building a sidewalk, congratulations. It's happening. There's, that's it. Staff has no discretion to say yes, no, or otherwise. That's how it currently works. In the future, you'll, you, you, you would have a tool that could allow in some situations defined by you when a developer could cut the city a check to go into the sidewalk fund and not build their sidewalk as part of their project. That's the simplest version. And do you propose under this ordinance or this general statute that, whatever it is, the name of it, that uh, there would be a sunset period on when if somebody posted a thousand dollars for a sidewalk, is it, going, is it going to be in that sinking fund for 15 years, or is it going to get spent in that in that fiscal that would year? Be or? Yeah, that would be completely up to the board. What, what, what I'm trying to, I'm trying, my job is to get you a law that gives the city the most flexibility. Mm -hmm. So if I were king, my law would simply read, the city of Newburn has the authority to impose a fee in lieu of sidewalk construction on reasonable terms, period. Okay. That's what I would like to see. And then you have all the power from that grant of authority to make up whatever rule you want that seems fair and reasonable to you and what's best for the city. Is there um, elect officials or is the development com community, who is, who is, who got this on the agenda? What? A staff, staff and me. We, we've, we've been pitching this to boards for at least a decade. Um, so we're, we're used to being rejected, um, but s since you were asking for local bills, we thought we would bring it up okay. one more time. I get calls from, I've had three calls in the last year from developers bending my ear on why in the world does this rule exist? Can't I just give you money? I, I get the vision of the sidewalks. I love sidewalks. I don't want a sliver of sidewalk in front of my property going to nowhere in a, with a mile of nothing on either side. Those are the calls that I get. Maybe you've not been getting them. I think they call me thinking that I can fix something uh, and I have to tell them the bad news that I can't. And again, I, I think we're almost wasting the debate on it right now because you know we are debating if these are the details, but you make a good point, Mayor, and what I guess I think you're saying is all anybody building would pay into this fund whether a sidewalk went there or not. No, ma'am. Uh, no, ma'am. Is ma it possible that sidewalks, because he is correct when he says this side of the street probably will never have sidewalks, but this side of the street will. Um, how do you? Two, two issues. Him, two, two, two issues. <laughs> um, I mean, make this simple. One point that I hear you making is that this may be a good moment to revisit the pedestrian plan to make sure that we're all still on board and that it makes sense and that the areas in those corridors are sidewalk buildable. Like it, can, it can actually happen geographically. So maybe we need to brush it off, do a drive around, and make sure that the plan is still a good plan. That's one thing I'm hearing. The second thing that's getting a little confusing is that the notion of an impact fee. An Im a true impact fee is a fund that every developer pays into to go fund the new park or fund the new school, fund something that's not part of their development. 
Right now in the current land use statutes, the city has the option to adopt an ordinance to do the same thing for streets. So we can go to a developer in our land use ordinance, we can tell a developer, you build the street or you give us the money and we'll build the street if we want. We have that authority. But the statute doesn't talk about sidewalks and other issues and that's what makes me pause that we don't have the authority for that specific issue. So, so the point is, it's, we have the authority to do stuff on site. An impact fee is costs that are off site. Here, you're going to have a sidewalk on your property, or you're going to pay us money, but you're not going to pay more. You're, you're going to pay the cost that you were going to incur otherwise. But, but in theory, if the city gets the money and puts it into a sidewalk fund, we have the ability to go look for grants, to cost match, and raise more money, for one thing, and then to build out the sidewalk in a more logical fashion that makes sense. Those are the two benefits primarily. I know that's confusing. <laughs> so, um, are, is Mr. Rogier, are you do you see any areas where the city, uh, the Board of Almonds, should uh, refine the pedestrian plan from well, 2010 period? Well, the, pedestrian, the pedestrian plan is very robust, and it uh, um, ranks certain corridors and certain areas on a high, medium, and low priority. Um, our land use code doesn't make any distinction on implementing what priority it's all. So it's on the plan, it's getting built, as Scott said, when it goes through one of those processes. So there is plenty of opportunity to revisit that plan and say, okay, what, what is the most important? And maybe part of the ordinance is a fee in lieu for certain corridors where it's really important to have connectivity and have a, not maybe everywhere, um, things like that. But again, those are the details. So. Um, to answer your question, it is extremely robust to put sidewalks in a, a lot of different places. Um, so it was really uh, impossible to pick and choose uh, the high priority or the medium priority. Some of the medium priority have become high priority just as our development pattern has changed over the past 10 years. So uh, as, uh, as the attorney said, it probably is a, a prudent time to revisit that, um, that plan and take a look at it and look really what is a priority area and really what may not be. We'll just see like the Mark Marietta plant and I mean Mark Marietta Quarry uh, recreation facility, there's been some changes and I know that in reading over the plan, it looks to be like maybe the city has fulfilled maybe 20% of the original uh, conceptual idea, design, whatever. But um, in reading it, it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't get an, an emphasis on, on sidewalks like I think the board has kind of taken in the last two or three years. I don't, I'm just wondering if you, we should uh, maybe refresh the, the plan. Uh, sure. When I read it, it, it doesn't outright speak about sidewalks. I don't, I don't see it, but I mean, maybe it's there and I'm not reading it right. Yeah, it's an overall pedestrian plan. So there's trails, bike, you know, bike right. and, uh, and walking. So it's the, it's the whole gambit of non-vehicular mobility. Yes, ma'am. So what I'm hearing is that this request before us tonight is just to get this tool available for us so that then we as a board can come back and tweak it and re refine it how we want it, which is going to be best for the city. Yes, ma'am, or, or ultimately decide that the time is not right. Okay. But without the tool, you got what you got right now. And there's a version too, I want to say this, it is entirely possible that when this request goes to the, the general counsel for the legislature, that I'll get a letter back saying, the state believes you already have this authority and here it is right here. I would love to have that letter. City manager and I have had this conversation many times. There are a, a dozen at least cities that already do this. And their argument is that a sidewalk is like a street and therefore they have the authority. And that's fine and I hope they're right and that'd be great. But I've been doing this too long um, and kicked myself many times for not getting a local bill as an insurance policy to make sure that we are exactly right. And I will remind you of the, the sewer impact fees where every city in the state had an impact fee for decades and decades and decades 
only to have somebody point out, um, you know, five, ten years ago that uh, we didn't actually have that authority. And well, a lot you didn't of, have that authority to overcharge the fair market value of an impact, and people were out there charging crazy prices like uh, cartridge, and uh, that's why that happened. It's, the well, the distinction that were doing an equitable charge, I don't think they had that much to worry about. Well, the, the problem they had is that we were fortunate in that we defined our fee as a fee to retire existing debt and to pay off the existing system. Most cities set their fee to fund further progress. So even cities that had the same fee we had ended up paying out millions of dollars because they didn't have the authority to charge for a fee for something to be built in the future, Newburn's fee was based on paying back the past cost. That was our good fortune. But there were two lawyers in the state decades ago that despite the fact that everybody else was doing it, went and got local bills. And they were sleeping great at night when the rest of us were a bit worried. Right. Well, anything, anybody else on this one? It's the board's pleasure. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion we adopt a resolution to request local legislation to authorize the city of Newburn to change a fee in lieu of construction for sidewalks required for new developments requiring site plan review. Second. Uh, motion and second. Is there discussion? Seeing none, let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Bingle. Alderman Bingle? Yes. Alderwoman Harris? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Mayor Outlaw? No. Alderman Kinsey? Alderman Bess? Yes. Alderman Odom. Yes. Okay, the motion carries. Item number 13. Thank you, Mayor. Item number 13 is a resolution approving a sewer use agreement for 431 Riverside Drive. The owners at that uh, subject address have a, an existing single family residence on the subject property, uh, which is outside the municipal limits of Newburn. They desire to connect to the city sewer collection system. The home has a calculated average daily rate of 480 gallons per day, which would require standard sewer connection. Uh, without the need for a main extension. Uh, our code 7474 uh, of the city's ordinances provides that a written water and sewer use agreement be entered into uh, to outline the roles and responsibilities of each party. There's a memo that's included in your packet from Mr. Hughes. And just as a side, uh, many of you are familiar probably with this area over uh, in the Bridgeton, Sandy Point area, Riverside Drive, where this uh, particular lot is located, oftentimes runs into sewer uh, perk issues with their septic system, so oftentimes they're coming to us requesting sewer uh, agreements and attaching to our system. So happy to answer any questions. Does the board have questions? Is no, I just want to reconfirm, Mark, that this is the first step, and the next step would be annexation, correct? So they would have to be then annexed into the city of New Bern in order to. That is outlined, the yes. When, when we refer to this agreement and outlining the roles and responsibilities of both parties, our role and responsibility is to provide them sewer. Their role and responsibility is to request the annexation uh, upon uh, signing the agreement. So yes, ma'am. Nobody else has any questions. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt a resolution approving a sewer use agreement for 431 Riverside Drive. Second. Motion and second. Is there a discussion? Seeing none, let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Odom. Alderman Odom? Yes. Alderman Bess? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Mayor Outlaw? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Alderwoman Harris? Yes. Alderman Deagle? Yes. Motion carries. I'm number 14. Thank you, Mayor. I'm number 14. Is a resolution approving a hazard mitigation grant program, Project 4393-0015-R sales agreement, and contact for the purchase of 821 Bloomfield Street. Um, the city was uh, interested in voluntarily acquiring properties in flood prone areas uh, in the city under FEMA's hazard mitigation grant program. The main purpose of this program is to mitigate the risk of loss of life and property from future disasters. This resident at 821 Bloomfield Street was selected through that process. It's a 407 process, if you may have heard of that. Uh, the purchase price of the property is $4,000. The purchase is subject to and dependent upon HMGP funding. The city is not committed to nor obligated to purchase the property uh, if the HMGP funding is not available. There's a memo that's been included from Ms. Olin Salem in your packet, and she's here to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, can, can the board vote on all three of these in one vote? Yes, sir. They certainly, certainly can. You want to do, do that? Yeah. 
question? Yes, ma'am. Um, since we're going to do all three of them at one time, because I see two of them is in Ward 5. Um, Amanda, Jeff, um, I have a question because I'm a little bit concerned. Um, we're at this point and we only have three properties that we've at the point of having an offer to purchase on. Um, and first of all, let me say this. Mr. Jerry and Amanda, I know that your department has worked diligently with this 404 and 407 mitigation plan. Um, but my concern is right now is that here we are two years and four months later and we only have three properties. So I'm a little alarmed with that because I just feel like at this point we should have more. And again, I know that your department has been working really hard considering this your daily operations of your department and then you've had all these other projects that you've taken on, like the Redevelopment Commission, the, the Resiliency and Hazard uh, Mitigation Plan, and then with these two FEMA uh, mitigation plans and not even including the additional grant writing. So I thank you for that and don't think that I'm saying that your department, you haven't done your job because you have. But I just want to know why we are only sitting at three properties two years and four months later. Is there a reason because you're not, you're not staffed properly to handle this workload? Is it that you need more staff to accommodate our citizens to try to get this grant process um, expedited? Is, what, what, is there something that we as a board need to look at to see to help accommodate your department with? So that's just some questions that, you know, maybe you and Mr. Jerry can answer for me. I would appreciate it. Um, well, first off, I will specifically address the hazard mitigation grant program. The reason that there are only three properties being considered is this is the hazard mitigation grant program. The 407 expedited acquisition program. This is a voluntary program. We began accepting interested parties and applications following Hurricane Florence. For the 407 expedited application process, we submitted a letter of interest or intent to uh, North Carolina Emergency Management back in December of 2018. That's when our initial deadline was. We had five properties that were proposed um, with that original submission. Uh, two property owners elected to withdraw from the program throughout the duration of that time. Um, we have been working very, very closely with North Carolina Emergency Management and FEMA, uh, responding to any um, requests that they had for additional information, working directly with homeowners. Um, and this project was an expedited program, so that is why we are bringing forward the offers for 407 now. Uh, we had to wait some time before FEMA could provide us with the duplication of benefit information that we needed in order to finalize those offers. We conducted independent appraisals and had everything else ready to go, but we have to validate um, any additional funding or uh, FEMA funding or insurance proceeds that the homeowners received previously uh, from previous disasters to incorporate that into what the final offer could be. Um, so the 407 program, we are to the point to make offers and then the next step, once those are closed, demolition, et cetera, and we will you know, own that property in perpetuity. The hazard mitigation grant program, the 404 program, is still being considered. It's still in the application development phase. There are no other uh, counties or municipalities throughout North Carolina in any of the impacted counties where those decisions have been made yet. We initially proposed 71 properties for either acquisition or elevation through that program, 17 for acquisition, 54 for elevation. Uh, we've been gathering information, responding to the numerous and countless requests from the state of North Carolina emergency management, as well as any, any requests that FEMA has. 
Um, but our understanding is that the state has packaged those applications for consideration to FEMA, and now it's basically uh, under further review. There are no decisions have been made, no funding uh, amount has come down as far as which projects will be awarded for the HMGP 404. So, so everything you just told me sounds like work. <laughs> yes. Lots of work. And I just feel that if you, maybe I, from my eyesight, I think that if you have more staff to help with this project, with these projects that your office has taken on, I think that would help expedite this process some because you would have more tools, you'd have more people working to try to get, to deal with the consultants, to deal with FEMA, to deal with the state. So that's all I'm saying is that, um, believe me, I appreciate all the work that you do, you and Jeff, your department, your great department, all of your staff. Right. So it's, it's, it's as far as I'm concerned, it's, I just want to, the city, we as a okay. city, to have our department staff so that we can help accommodate the needs of our citizens. That, that's just the bottom line. So thank you, Alderman Best, for the, for the kind words. I mean, it does a great job. Um, in this scenario, obviously, um, we learned a lot uh, through the process. But at, at this point, it, this isn't a staffing issue is why we're not getting the funding or it appears like we're being not responsive. Um, it really is at the state level right. um, where they really, really don't seem like they really understand the process. Or, um, or we'll get a deadline through an email. Amanda will get a deadline. And it's it's the next day. She'll get an email at four o'clock for a, you know a substantial amount of work to be done by eight o'clock the next morning. And we've had two or three examples of that. Yeah. Very simple. I think we forwarded a couple of moments to you to illustrate exactly. that it's not a staffing issue. So um, with that, I think the state needs to learn a lot more. Um, we definitely learned a lot uh, through this process, but. Um, the reason why it's been so long has nothing to do with staffing. Amanda does an excellent job, and whatever the whatever the work's required, she 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 gets it done, um, irrespective of how much effort that uh, that it requires. So, so uh, it's not taken away from her job. Oh, it absolutely takes away from her job. That's what I'm getting. Yeah, and, and that's. Do you need and, some extra? Yeah, I mean, Amanda <laughs> has been the uh, FEMA HMGB exactly. grant administrator for two two years, okay. and it takes a substantial, probably 50 percent of her day. Uh, every day for two and a half years, which really limits her ability to be the economic development director for the city or manager for the city. Uh, she also does a great job with our CDBG program, obviously, uh, with the Asia. So there's all the great things that uh, her time should be spent on, but unfortunately, Hurricane Florence uh, wouldn't let that happen. And Al, she isn't she uh, your instrumental in the redevelopment commission as well? Absolutely. So, okay. All right, that's. If there's no other questions, I'd like to make a motion. Um, I'd like to make a motion to adopt a resolution approving approve um, a hazard mitigation grant program project 4393-0015R sale agreement and contract for the purchase of 821 Bloomfield Street, 1906 Alabama Avenue, and 204 Beach Street. Second. second. Motion and second. Is there discussion? I got a question. Yes, sir. Um, how long will it be before you will actually be able to close and give the property owners money? And I'm asking for a, a particular person that's in the room here that's been waiting for a long time. <laughs> Uh, we have already spoken with all of these property owners and, and obviously they are eager to close. So once um, you all approve the offer, we will get certified letters out um, for them to approve. And then i uh, been speaking you know, often with Scott's office, so he's ready to move as quickly as we can. And of course, you know, this is an expedited pro program. We want to <laughs> expedite it as much as possible since there have been so many delays that have been out of our hands. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Odom. Alderman Odom? Yes. Alderman Des? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Mayor Outlaw? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Alderwoman Harris? Yes. Alderman Dingle? Yes. Motion carries. I have number 17. 
Thank you, Mayor. Item number 17, <coughs> resolution designated agents for Hurricane East Ice. Uh, FEMA requires the governing board to designate authorized agents for the purpose of executing and filing applications for federal and or state assistance under the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act. Uh, the proposed resolution you see before you tonight uh, names our city's primary and secondary agents for seeking assistance with Hurricane Isaias. So uh, there's a memo that's included in your packet from Ms. Hogan. Um, and uh, ultimately, the, the Board of Aldermen tonight will authorize Lori Mulliken and Mary Hogan as the primary and secondary agents uh, for the city to work on this project. We're happy to answer any questions. Okay. Board have questions. There's no questions. I'd like to make a motion. <clears throat> to make a motion to adopt a resolution designating agents for Hurricane Isa Isa. Second. Second. I'm glad she said it. Is there discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, seven roll call starting with Alderman Bingle. Alderman Bingle? Yes. Alderwoman Harris? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Mayor Outlaw? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Alderman Best? Yes. Alderman Odom? Yes. Motion carries on number 18. Thank you, Mayor. Item number 18 is for a hurricane project uh, that's uh, a little bit more easier for us to uh, pronounce, uh, and we remember it really well. Uh, this is an ordinance amendment to close out uh, the FEMA Hurricane Irene Project Fund. Um, as you recall, ago. Hurricane Irene <laughs> occurred in August of 2011. Uh, that was my welcome to Newburn uh, gift that I got whenever I was here for about seven months. Uh, the project fund was established to recognize the cost of repairs and anticipated revenues from FEMA. Uh, FEMA has now officially closed out Hurricane Irene and there remains $14,524.07 of costs that were not reinforce, uh, reimbursed by FEMA. So this budget ordinance amendment acknowledges a transfer from the general fund for the remaining unreimbursed cost and closes the FEMA Hurricane Irene project fund. Memo including your packet from uh, Ms. Hogan and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Praise the Lord. <laughs> What, I'm just I'm just curious. What did they not pay? What was this fourteen thousand dollars for? I, it was an insurance issue. Yeah, I think it, it was, was. It was just very. It was some minimal. If I can remember, I, it's it's been from the very beginning an insurance issue on one of the project worksheets, where there was more insurance money allotted than what I think was originally reported. I think that's the case. Mary, does that sound right? Mayor, like make a motion we adopt the ordinance amendment to close the FEMA Hurricane Irene Project Fund. Second. Motion and second. Is there a discussion? Seeing on the sub roll call, starting with Alderman Odom. Alderman Odom? Yes. Alderman Best? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Mayor Outlaw? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Alderwoman Harris? Yes. Alderman Dingle? Yes. Motion carries item number 19. <laughs> Mayor, item number 19 is an ordinance to establish a community development block grant coronavirus grant fund. Uh, the city has been awarded phase one CDBG CV grant funds in the amount of $152,252. The program is designed to address the impacts of the coronavirus and Newburn intends to use the funds to help low and moderate income individuals in the city with utility and rental assistance. The grant will be provided to a local nonprofit to administer the program uh, the city will also adhere to the CDBG sub-recipient monitoring plan as we do with most of their programs uh, approved by the board at its last meeting to ensure uh, the program meets the established criteria and HUD requirements and regulations. Ms. Hogan has provided a memo. We're happy to answer any questions. Does the board have questions? Yes, I have a question. Who would be the sub-recipient of this? RCS? That's correct. All right, thank you. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt the ordinance to establish the Community Development Block Grant Coronavirus Grant Fund. Second. Motion and second. Is there a discussion? Seeing none, let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Dingle. Alderman Dingle? Yes. Alderwoman Harris? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Mayor Outlaw? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Alderman Best? Yes. Alderman Ida. Yes. Motion carries item number 20. Thank you, Mayor. Item number 20 is an ordinance amendment for the Entitlement Cities Community Development Block Grant Fund. Uh, after being deemed the CDBG Entitlement City, the Entitlement Cities CDBG Grant Fund ordinance was established on the 12th of August 20, 2014 
The city receives annual funding from HUD for this program and the award for fiscal year 2020 is $258,775. The ordinance recognizes that award and appropriates the funds. Um, Ms. Mem uh, Ms. Hogan has once again provided a memo. We're happy to answer questions. Does the board have questions? Uh, yes. <laughs> So Mark, this is an award that we get yearly if we apply for, or is it's this is a, this is an automatic award. Uh, it used to be through CDBG. We had to compete with rural mm -hmm. um, North Carolina. Now that we have reached a certain population, we are entitled to a certain amount of CDBG funds each year, and that's this is also the plan that comes before you that gets amended on a yearly basis and approved sometimes even frequently uh, uh, through amendments. Uh, than, than a yearly basis, but ultimately we have to present to y'all a plan, how we plan to spend the money, we have to report that to CDBG, but this is the funds we receive each year in very close to this amount every single year. Okay, thank you. If there's no questions, I'd like to make a motion. Um, I'd like to make a motion to adopt an ordinance amendment for the Entitlement Cities Community Development Block Grant Fund. Second. Motion and second. Is there a discussion? Seeing none, all, uh, excuse me, uh, let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Dingle. Alderman Dingle? Yes. Alderwoman Harris? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Mayor Outlaw? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Alderman Best? Yes. Alderman Adam? Yes. Motion carries item number 21. Thank you, uh, board. Item number 21 is a budget ordinance amendment for FY 2021 operating budget. Uh, this budget ordinance reestablishes encumbrances and purchase orders as outstanding as of the 30th of June 2020. Uh, that will be honored in fiscal year 2021. It also appropriates an additional $25,000 for the assistant attorney, which Mr. Davis uh, spoke with you in, uh, tonight about. Uh, $23,963 in insurance proceeds for the replacement of vehicle. $14,550 for the Hurricane Irene unfunded FEMA expenditures that was discussed prior. Uh, so uh, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Board have questions. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion we adopt a budget ordinance amendment for FY 2021 operating budget. Second. Motion and second. Is, is there discussion? Seeing none, have roll call starting with Alderman Odom. Alderman Odom? Yes. Alderman Best? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Mayor Outlaw? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Alderwoman Harris? Yes. Alderman Dingle? Yes. Okay, let's go to appointments. Alderman Dingle? I have none tonight, sir. Alderwoman Harris? I have none tonight, sir. Alderman Astor? None tonight. Alderman Kinsey? Got the right, sir. Alderman Best? None. Alderman Adam? No, sir. Attorney's report? City manager's report? Um, more question, Mayor, uh, as, and, and I guess kind of an update. Uh, we um, are set to have our retreat on the 5th of February, and um, I did reach out to the Doubletree regarding possibly having it there, uh, and uh, I, I did get um, um, I did get a, an agreement back from them, uh, basically setting the room rental rate for the large ballroom that they usually charge for about three thousand dollars for they gave us a, a, a lower rate uh, for four hundred dollars to do our retreat at that location uh, if we do uh, snacks or lunches or whatever we obviously have to use them for those uh, particular items but being that we're starting at one o'clock uh, may not be that we need lunches if everybody comes uh, prior to with uh, have already eaten their lunch so at this point I'm looking for direction from the board if the board wishes to uh, pursue this agreement I uh, did reach out to the, uh, the, the county convention center. Uh, they were a little higher. Uh, so, uh, and then obviously the other options we could look at are some of our own facilities such as uh, West Newman Recreation, but obviously we have some sound and quality issues there and, and other programming that's already scheduled, but uh, we could potentially work and cancel if we needed to. So basically at this point, we have uh, uh, set aside the time for the meeting. We just need to know where and when and, and, and uh, those kinds of details. So we don't have any facilities that we could host our own meeting? Um, I'm sure we could come up with some. Uh, like I said, West Newburn Recreation Center. Uh, I don't know if we have enough room 
considering social distancing requirements to do it at development services like we normally do. Uh, if anybody from the public shows up, uh, just trying to manage some of the social distancing, coronavirus uh, distancing things. So you kind of need a little bit of a larger space. Um, so, um, and, and larger spaces are a little bit more limited. You have to look at um, um, usually outside of, outside of the city, uh, um, owned facilities other than our recreation centers. We only have one of those that's operational at this time. Well, as, as um, Alderman Asker mentioned at our last meeting, why not having it right here? Uh, again, I'm, I'm happy to do whatever the board wants to do. I was um, just trying to have options. All right, I understand. Well, I just, and I have I no issue with being here. I think the idea was we're going to be sitting for four or five hours. Um, I guess these chairs are as comfortable as anywhere else. Get up and walk around. I mean, that's not a bad idea. Then, then we could potentially start at noon and bring lunch and start at noon and have something like that because I think we want to try to get through as much as we can in an afternoon. Go with whatever. You just need directions, sir. Board needs to call for and uh, make a motion and a right. second and approve the meeting location, the time, um, and uh, the date. Well, I'll make a motion that we have our uh, City of Newburn retreat February 5th, 1 p.m. Um, at City Hall. Second. Uh, Mr. Davis, do we need to include in case it runs over to Saturday? Does that need to be in, included in that? No, sir. It, the meeting will continue until you adjourn. Okay. Thank you. Everybody understand the motion? Any discussion? Um, let's just roll call so we know where we are on this on the thing. Yes. Yes. Alderman Astor. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Alvin. Yes. Alderman Kinsey. Yes. Alderman Bass. Yes. Alderman Odom. Yes. Okay. What, what else you got? That's all I have, sir. Stevens? Sir? I said that's all I have, sir. Okay. Uh, let's go to new business, starting with Alderman Odom. Uh, none tonight, sir. Alderman Bass? Nothing. Alderman Kinsey? None, sir. Uh, we'd like, uh, under new business, uh, Mr. Hughes, if you could just give us a, an update on the Martin Marietta. I was out there the other day, and it's really coming along out there, what you're doing. So uh, give us an update. Yes, sir. Currently, our staff is working on the new restrooms and shelter uh, at, at the location that we're calling the Swim Beach area. The new playground is scheduled to be delivered on Monday, so the staff will start installing that as well. In the past week and a half, we have blazed three and a half miles of new trails out there, so staff is working on adding base material out there. When it's all said and done, our first phase should have a little more than seven miles of walking trails. So. Um, if all goes well, weather works out, I think by April, May, we should have all of our signage out there, new entrance worked out, nice gate and things like that. And so uh, then we'll, we're going to start working toward phase two and three of this project. So uh, we're, we're pleased with the project we've seen uh, so far the, this past fall and so far this winter. What phase is the amphitheater in? Our goal is to start the amphitheater part as well as the uh, the ropes course and the uh, things like that in the next phase. That's the goal. Great job, Foster. It really looks good. Thank you. I, I just want to add to uh, Foster's. Foster and his staff have really maximized the mm -hmm. dollar that has been utilized out there. Uh, a lot of that has been done with staff time and staff expertise, especially the. Uh, picnic shelter, the restrooms that exist uh, over there currently, and then the new shelter and uh, that they're building currently right now. A lot of the, even Foster's been out there on some of the grading equipment on the weekends and stuff, uh, rental equipment, and actually out there doing the work. So uh, kudos yeah. to staff, a lot of uh, deferment of a cost that would, would, would normally have been through contractor work they've been doing themselves. It's amazing how that heavy equipment is such a stress reliever when you're on those things. So. <laughs> uh, Foster, you're not... Uh, working Miss Veronica too much, are you? Um, no, ma'am. <laughs> she, she, she's staying busy. <laughs> well, while you've got Foster up there, would you mind? I just want to um, thank you for um, the staff's great work at the UBO and cleaning up that area and keeping it maintained. Um, it, 
it looks 100% better, and I appreciate the efforts of the staff, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, great. That's, uh, do you uh, have a timeline with your conceptual design as to when you, on some of the larger projects, you might be looking for some private partnerships or anything? We're actually going to be talking about that during the budget retreat, okay, so you're going to see some of that information during my presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good job, Foster. Anybody else with uh, Foster? Mr. Stevens, uh, we had the board, I think, you know, a while back. Um, I know this has been asked several times. Where I, I just want to update on our sidewalk programs in New Bern, if you, what, what's going on and with the, with the budget amount, and I know um, – I know Matt's been working with uh, with some of those items. So I'll turn it over to Matt to give you an update on them. Uh, yes, sir. Just a quick update. We did have the two hundred fifty thousand dollars that was part of this year's budget. Uh, that plan has been sent out. We do have a contractor selected, and his start date is February fifteenth to start that project. And I will say they will be starting with the sidewalks along Country Club Road, as we have previously discussed. Any questions? Okay. I, just want to I don't want to compliment Matt on his shirt and tie tonight. My very, wife dresses very sharp. me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alderman Ash. Uh, nothing nice, sir. Alderman Harris. Yes, Mayor. Um, I wanted to know if Foster could come up to the mic and talk about the updated information from Stanley White in regards to um, an application being filled out for the location that it's currently at. Okay, so um, basically back in July of, of 2020, the Board of Aldermen requested a change in scope of work uh, to look at locating the Stanley White Recreation Center on the uh, Third Avenue location. And so uh, as that is taking place, we uh, contracted with CPL to work on an environmental assessment. CPL uh, is just about finished with the assessment itself. Uh, when I was talking to the consultant earlier, they anticipate uh, turning that in within the month. All they're waiting on really now is the soil boring, so we should have information back. We sh they should be sending that information into FEMA within the next month, and then however long it takes for FEMA to review that information and um, give us their answer. That's where we stand with that. Okay, and what about the added information about what they provided to us today? Did you get a chance to go over that as well? About filling out an application for it to be at the same location and ask for um, bigger square footage? So during the last Stanley White Recreation Center committee meeting, the, the committee had asked a few questions. They wanted to know, and I'll, I'll read these questions to you. Let me find those real quick. The committee wanted to know if the Stanley White Recreation Center square footage could be increased if it is built at the Henderson Park location, and if so, what was the process for making the change of scope request to increase the square footage at the Henderson Park site? So FEMA did respond with the question that if we were to do this, the city would have to make a request in writing to the state. The state would review that. and. Um, there would be a process to go through from there and that process would uh, include looking at a, we would have to request an improved project and that would go through uh, an environmental assessment process on, on the Henderson Park site and ultimately FEMA would decide yes or no what we would do with that. Okay, with that um, information, the board and the community um, are under the impression that um, when we voted to build the, um, the Stanley White in the same location, um, that we would be able to do that. And so now that we've discovered this new information, um, they're requesting that an application be submitted to FEMA to have it built in the same location, requesting um, a larger square footage. She wants to do what? She wants to look at building a bigger building on that site. Is that the question? Right, yes. The community is wanting us to fill out an application with FEMA, the same one we did in July, and request that the project be at the same location, and we're asking for a larger square footage at to build expense. a bigger building because we have the ability to do that with the new information that was provided. 
Well, that would be at our expense. I understand. I had a conversation with the mayor um, last year where he stated that it's possible that we can add more money to the project to be able to expand the new location. So if we were able to do that, I feel like we can vote to add money to expand the location in the same spot if FEMA approves it for a bigger square footage like we told the community two years ago that we supported it being built back in the same location. So now that we found out that it's possible, the community would like us to stand true to our word and fill out that application and submit it. Well, I think this board also voted to apply $8 million towards this purchase or towards building this building, and that's the money that we have. Uh, um, and I also feel that we're within 30 days of getting some answers from FEMA, and we shouldn't do anything to upset this, this process until we get answers from FEMA, and then there'll be plenty of time for us to decide what we're going to do. I understand, but the community is under the impression that we were doing what we were supposed to based on the information provided. Because we had that Stanley White meeting and the reps stated that it's possible to be built in the same location and request a larger square footage, it's only right that we do what we said we were going to do and fill out that application. Well, we don't have to fill out an application to build it in the same location. We've already got permission to do that. But no, we're asking for permission to move the project back to the same location and ask for a larger square footage. Because we were told two years ago that the building couldn't be any bigger than what it was. Last week, we found out that that's not the correct information, that we can request for it to be in the same location and the building can be bigger. We have to fill out the application. That's what the email stated. Well. Again, I'll say that we've, we're within 30 days or around 30 days of having a, a complete answer from FEMA as to what we can and can't do. And I just don't think that we should make any changes to anything until, I mean, it would start the process over. It may be another year before that FEMA, and plus it would, it would delete everything that we've done so far. You know, they would stop. I'm assuming, have you had any conversations about that, Foster? I'm assuming it would stop what we, the, the scope of work that we currently have open and move the scope of work back to where it's originally at. And it would, it would just, I, I just feel that we got 30 days before FEMA answers some questions and then we can make a decision of what we're going to do there. But I'll tell you, I, I'm not in favor of spending, how much is it a square foot to build over there? Uh, the Henderson Park location, yes. it, the estimates are about $372 a square foot. And what about at the other location? Approximately $250 a square foot on the Third <laughs> Avenue location. Yeah. And plus we're moving it out of a floodplain where we wouldn't have to build or pay for flood insurance for the life of the building to move it how many feet away, Foster? Uh, anywhere from 600 to 1,000 feet. A thousand feet. It was also stated in a previous meeting that if it's raised, that's considered out of the flood um, zone no. and the price would not be the same. No, it's still in a floodplain. I understand, Mr. Astor, but what we did is when we all voted and we stated that we were going to support what the community wanted and we were under the impression of one thing when that new information came out it's our responsibility as elected official to stand by our word and at least fill out the application for it to be back in the same location like the community has requested that's been the request from day one they've been without the center we supposedly have an alternative location for uh, all of the programs at the omega center that we can be utilizing and are utilizing and the community understands the process and they would like for us to fill out this application to have it built in the same location requesting a larger square footage so I'm just I'm just the messenger explaining what the community wants. If the board decides not to do that, then that's something that you decide to do. But I'm speaking for the ward and for the community that has stated from day one they want it built back in the same location. Alderman Adam, Foster or or Bobby, what what triggered the request or the requirement for the environmental assessment? 
I don't know. When, when an alternative site was found and the city purchased that property, when the property was purchased, that, that became an alternate site. And so that's when FEMA said an environmental assessment has to take place to see if that site is suitable to relocate. And what, what exactly does the environmental assessment entail? Is it just, I don't think it's what it sounds like. It's not just the environment of the location. No. Isn't it other things that's involved? It is a variety. It, it is a, a laundry list of, of things that they look at. Not only the historical aspects of the property itself, uh, what was built on the property previously with soil, soil borings and things like that. Uh, it looks at the uh, all types of environmental issues uh, that may be affected by the property as well. And it also takes into account uh, citizen concerns with this. So is there any any thought that an environmental assessment may be required if a change of scope is asked for to expand the current footprint? Is that possible? At the, at the current site? Right. We've got permission to build the building in the current no, site. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're changing, if you're going to change the footprint, because if I remember correctly, Tripp said that if you were to do that, you would, it would then trigger, you'd have to have stormwater ponds, there would be other things that would, so I'm, I'm just trying to say, I, I, I'm not making a decision tonight on changing the scope of work when we're this far deep into an environmental assessment that we were required to do. So if we it's get that back, a bunch of money. well, if we get that back and it says, you know, something there that we need to move on and, and try something different than we can. But like Alderman Best said, we're, we're how long now since the hurricane and we're just buying out three houses now. I don't want to do anything that's going to delay it, even if it's just two weeks. And that's my opinion. So, so, so Foster or, or Bobby, at this, at this point, you said that 30 days we'll be getting a report from FEMA? No, the, the, our consultants will be from finished the with the report and they'll submit that to FEMA for their review. Okay. And, and, so as, part, then, and as part of FEMA's review, there, there will be a, at least a 30-day window where they will accept public comments and then FEMA will make their ultimate decision and okay. report back to the city. And this is the process we're going through right now is that eight-step FEMA process that we have to go through. Well, the eight-step process is, is right alongside the environmental assessment. Okay. So, I, me personally, I, you know, I, I, I feel that I, from, for my self-satisfaction, so that I feel that I'm doing the best for the citizens of this, of this city, and especially for the, for the citizens of the Duffin Field and Five Points area, that I would want to have adequate information back that where we can spend this money and put a facility that's going to be a larger, build back better, larger out of a floodplain. So I'm waiting on the results from FEMA. I would like to state that the reason why the environmental assessment was triggered is because we applied for an application to move it out of the current location. If we would have known from day one that it could be built in the same location and request an application for a larger square footage, we would not be in this situation where we'd be following different steps. So again, the community who has elected us and pays tax dollars have requested from day one that it be built back in the same location. I don't understand why we're not doing Doing what the community has access to do. Alderman Harris, we as a board signed a, a resolution of intent based on FEMA and the engineers. So, and I understand what the community is asking for, and I'm all for getting this facility back up and running. But at this point of the game, I think that we need to at least step back and wait and see what the final decision is going to be from FEMA. And then at that point, if that's what we need to do, then we are sending a scope of work change to get to see what we can do to accommodate a larger facility at that current location. That's just my two cents. And I understand that, Alderman Best, but what I'm trying to get you to understand is that we only did a change of scope because we thought that it could not be built back in that same location and we purchased other land to move it out of the flood zone. We did sign a resolution saying that we support it to be built back in the same location based on FEMA. FEMA has just let us know in an email to the Stanley White Rec Community Advisement Board that it could be built back in the same location. We had to fill out a certain application and it asked for a larger square footage to be approved. Granted, they would only give us the money that they have approved and it would be our responsibility to add on 
as a board if we voted to put more money to the project to finish the project. That's, that's the difference. But we have said from the beginning that we would support what the community wanted. And now that we know this information two years later, when if we knew it two years before, we would have submitted the proper application. I understand that there may be only 30 days or 60 days, but who's to say that once we get the approval that the board is going to stand by their word and vote for it to be built back in the same location and then do another application for um, um, a new scope area. Okay, anything else on Woman Harris? Nope, that's all, Mayor. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, Alderman Bingham. One thing I was going to ask Mark, um, if he could um, give us a sudden link update. I know as of uh, probably Monday, I saw about 82 emails in the email stack. So I know that um, it is the topic of conversation everywhere I go. Um, and I, I guess how long will we collect these emails before we'll send them on to Attorney General or to the state? Legislators, I just wanted an update so the citizens know what we're I guess really that's up to the board. I don't know if you want to leave it open for another week or two or whatever, or if you want to leave it open for the month. Um, I'm happy to do that. Uh, ultimately, we've already sit, submitted our letter and sent that to uh, the uh, uh, Attorney General at the, uh, at the state level as well as the uh, individuals that you had requested, uh, our state representatives. So we've submitted our letter, uh, much like Tarboro did. Uh, but we will also send these emails if that's what the board so chooses they wish us to do. We'll try not to send them individually and make it uh, so uh, burdensome for them, but we will send those in a group of, of messages on to uh, those individuals as well once we've received them all. So it's really up to the board. If you want to leave, so, uh, leave it open for a month, we'll do that. If you want me to send it tomorrow, I can do that. We've got, like you said, about 80-some emails that are in there already. Uh, and not all of them are city residents. There's some that have appreciated and watch our show that live in the county or James City or wherever that have also submitted their concerns as well. Yeah, I think um, it's easy to read. If anybody, they can go to our website, and there on our website, there's an area where you can click on a link, and you can see all of the emails that are there. I've just copied and pasted that link to some contacts that I have so they can see what we're seeing. And I think, again, if you want to leave it open, till you know the 31st of January I would then at least package them up and send because I bet you we'll have a hundred by then and I think yeah. it makes a very strong statement I certainly can do that that's the board of electors um Arnold Bingo, I really appreciate you bringing that up because uh, you know I'd, I'd like 2021 to be the year of the internet provider you know um and and I, I know that we're all working hard on this we we want to help our citizens out I think part of that Necessities can be the mother of invention, and um, Alderman Bingo and I, uh, you, you don't, you know, if you want to mention just a little bit about, we, you had somebody that you kind of put me on the phone with, with you um, that has an innovative idea. Um, today, some uh, of the Alderman we talked with, uh, don't mind saying Google, and uh, we're going to keep looking, and we're going to provide some opportunities. Uh, I see from this, um, and I talked with an attorney with the League of Municipalities this afternoon, Alderman um, Odom and I, and um, from a legal standpoint, you know, in Greenville, North Carolina, back in the late 70s, VEPCO, Virginia Electric Power, which is now Old Dominion, was, was so high that uh, the General Assembly got involved and ultimately uh, knocked the legs out from underneath the stool and pretty much ran them out of most North Carolina, replaced them with uh, Duke Energy. Problem solved. The problem we have here <clears throat> is that if the General Assembly gets, gets in the business of it with a, with, a, with a model that is somewhat outdated and everybody's with, oh, when 5G comes, it'll be, you know, everything be fixed. That's not necessarily so. There's still gonna to need to be some landlines, obviously coaxials going to fiber optics. And um, so as, as the business model continues to evolve, um, if, if we were to use the same action that the General Assembly took with VEPCO, guess what? Everybody doesn't have any provider now. As bad as you might not like Sunlink, it's better than not having anything because nobody's coming back in here behind them. Now, the only solution to that is for some help from the legislature and others. Um, 
to find a provider that sees uh, an opportunity in Eastern North Carolina, maybe we'll buy out a bunch of these that don't want to be in business here, which is uh, seems to be the case. So um, what I see in, in my um, analysis of this is that probably in the next five years, there will be 15, 20 small entrepreneurs that will come in and figure out somehow to get with some fiber optics, not coaxial, and they will come out with transmitters, and they will come out with the end user that will have a receiver, and that will be one source, but that will only be for fortunate areas that the, the numbers work. I, I would immediately, if I was Fairfield Harbor, River Bend, I'd, I'd be out there looking at somebody with a fiber optic line to come in and give me uh, a 400 foot tower or a 45 foot tower and get a signal and everybody out there get a receiver. The only problem with that, I'll remind them, you can chime in. Um, that's only internet. That's not part of what the customer wants. They want the TV package. So then if uh, in one particular case in, in this area, not in the city of limits, but because we have the fiber optics and maybe we can help, um, an innovative idea is um, a gentleman is interested in receiving Charlie the, the white, the our fiber optics. But then uh, in addition to that package, and Charlie, come on up and, and talk a little bit, if you will, you know, and straighten me out on all my inaccuracies, if there are. Um, that, that particular case is where a person wants to use our fiber optic lines. And then that's another thing I'd like the board to discuss is, is a consultant to help the electric department if they need it to identify everything we have and what the capacities of our lines are, where they are. But in that model, it would be a connection with uh, a provider so that those residents can get a TV package. Well, I'm like, well, if you're gonna do that, just go deal with the provider, not the city of Newburn. So, you know, the most efficient model to get things rolling is just the internet provider end of it. And then residents are gonna to have to go out and decide on their own if it's Roku or whatever, a package, but it's not gonna be a sudden link package. I don't know if you wanna, yeah, I was, just gonna, there. I was gonna say one thing. Um, when we started getting some of this feedback from folks in the community, I, I think it may have given the misconception that we have some sort of authority over that because some of the emails came in as, you know, revoke their license or their privilege to do business. I just wanna make it clear that we no longer have that authority. That's the reason we're kind of in the position that we're in. So for anybody watching, there's nothing that we can do. Suddenlink is a private company. Just like if you don't like Smithfield Chicken, we can't go out and start telling Smithfield Chicken they can't operate anymore in Newburn. So I want to clarify that. But um, the other piece I wanted to, to hopefully clarify is everybody says, well, you all are telling me there's nothing you can do about it. You don't have any authority. But yet Greenville just signed this agreement with this company, and they've got this big partnership. So what we have found out is um, the partnership that Greenville has is essentially they have allowed this new company, so a new sudden link, if you will, to come in and put their lines and infrastructure down in the right of way of the city. I don't believe, from what the information we were told, there's no funding from Greenville, there's no public private partnership. It's a company has come in and said, We want to do business in Greenville, can we use your right of way? Greenville gave them the authority to do so, so that's where the partnership goes. So I just want to clarify that because I know a lot of people are asking, Why aren't we doing more? So. And I think we would probably vote unanimously if anybody wants to come use our right of way to put in some infrastructure, we'd be more than happy for them to do that. It's just the business model usually doesn't work out. But the part to that is that the MetroNet would only serve cherry pick lucrative markets within Greenville. It would not, I mean, I think there's a perception that all of a sudden they're gonna come in and suddenly it's gonna be out of business. That's not gonna happen. Suddenly it's gonna still have a, a presence there. And uh, so anyway, uh, that's why MetroNet and Greenville will be like individual entrepreneurs and others that are gonna come into the city of Newburn. There's gonna be bunches of them, and we want that from what the way things are going. Uh, Charlie, we've talked some, could you kind of, um, kind of bring this to a close, what we're doing, what the potentials are? Um, 
issues like that, you know. Uh, I know that we talked some today with some individuals about how to help areas. It, it, there, there you are with the rural city divide. Uh, as much as we can do is where our infrastructure is in place. So that doesn't really help the rural areas. So um, I don't know if we have an argument or not, but I, I haven't heard anybody get the FCC involved in this. So maybe that's another um, Maybe the FCC somewhere to send complaints, but go ahead. Well, currently, the, the actions that I've taken, what we have in place is we have an existing fiber system that belongs to the city of New Bern, and it serves municipal services and it serves utility services. That has evolved over the last 20 years. Um, I'm working on an effort to map that out in great detail so that we better understand it. Concurrently doing that, I've gone I've written a scope for an RFQ to request for qualifications to find the appropriate consultant that can come in and help us advise us on our existing system as well as help us examine and lead us through this thought process on how do we expand competition in the New Bern marketplace, how do we bring um, those services up to the expectations of our community. So that's Well, let me ask you this, and I'll, this, Steve, you can help out. When Carolina Colors went in, they put the coaxial in, and of course the question I have off for 20 years is that, is that equipment as good as it was then? The technology's obviously changed, but Mr. Stevens, I think the original idea of um, uh, the provider was not the provider that it has now. And so is, is there the potential, Charlie and, and Mr. Stevens, to go into areas that, um, are similar to the Carolina Colors model that uh, the city could have some skin in the game of, of helping the communities at Greenbrier, somewhere like that, that we could help them uh, do something similar to what Carolina Colors did. I, I think what I'm hearing you describe in my mind is the city playing the role of last mile provider or middle mile provider. And from what I understand, currently North Carolina does not allow municipals to play in that market space. So, Mr. Stevens, um, the, Thank you. The, the the Carolina Colors model, Mayor, is is a, a developer initiated model to where um, let's let's essentially they took themselves and created themselves as a small city, even though it's private. And they have the ability, because they have the right to, sell themselves as a bulk customer, uh, which in, in a sense was essentially what municipalities had the ability to do some time ago, was to be able to sell themselves as a bulk customer through a franchise agreement. Uh, now granted, you still have to have a provider, you still have to have someone that's connecting to it and, and providing it, whether that's going to be Suddenlink, whether that's MetroNet, whether that's Google Fiber, whether that's whoever. Um, what Carolina Colors model is, is they lump everybody in the subdivision as a bulk unit and sell that bulk unit in mass to um, a provider <coughs> to drive their price down so that they're not picking DirecTV, Dish Network, Suddenlink, uh, you know, whatever other options uh, that are uh, HughesNet, whatever else is out there that's provided a service, they bulk themselves together, they sell it as a bulk package, both the television and their fiber <coughs> connections, but the developer invested in the entire system prior to any of the other um, uh, options being available. So they invested in the system, the infrastructure was paid for by the developer, and therefore the customers at that point, which are the homeowners in that area, they get sold as a bulk, and then they get a lower price, essentially, for their services. Well, you know, uh, New Bern and Rutherford and Eastern North Carolina took the lead in the buyout, and we paid a lot of freight to legal in the, the buyout. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to see this, the city mothers and fathers think of similarly with this problem. Um, reaching out to other cities and trying to get a modified, refined bill to the original 2010 bill that the city of Newburn is not interested itself in getting into the business, but we don't, we, we need some relief in helping others that do want to get into the business. And, and, and that way the city of Newburn is not competing, nor are <coughs> other municipalities, but we're in a position to help the free enterprise 
free market come in here and, you know, pick your flavor of internet <coughs> provider services? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Um, you might get our local delegation, and I can I can forward to you the the um, the statute. Um, there's a bill pending from 2019 proposing to do that very thing, to allow local governments to put in broadband fiber optic as a backbone throughout their city and then let private companies tap onto that. Um, that's out there. It's been talked about. This, we're not inventing anything. The, the model, the idea, the law is sitting there. It's just not been passed. So maybe some traction to, to, to get that adopted would allow cities like us <coughs> to take advantage of what we already have in place. Yes, sir. Scott, doesn't, doesn't the law, as it is today, essentially disenfranchise rural areas because Google Fiber or whoever else, it's, it's cost, it, it makes sense for them with the, the, the numbers, if you will. It works out to go to big areas because you have density, you have a lot of users. So what it's doing, we've got a law that supposedly the state is all about rural broadband. That's a talking point you hear every two years when they run for office. But yet, here's a law that's on the books that they could fix that would allow us the flexibility to partner with somebody. So that's the message we need to get across, correct? Amen. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, the bill, what it needs to be is if you've got a geographic area which these guys individually decide, you know, you don't come in my area, I don't come in yours. It's all between the cartel. And if there were some means as to what the enforcement of this geographic area, if you had to serve everybody just like Charlie, you have to serve everybody within our, there's not a customer prep choice. It's, we have an area and we have to serve it, right? And so does Duke and all the co-ops. But unfortunately, the, 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 the good folks in the Spectrum and Sunlink business, if they don't want to serve something, it's cost prohibitive, they, they don't serve it, right? Right. That, that's, the, that's where the bill needs to be changed. <coughs> anyway. Um, Alderman Bingo, you were. I was it. That's all I have. Thank you. Does the board need to, uh, it, Mr. Stevens, from what all we've talked, um, anything further? I guess maybe at the retreat we can talk some more about internet, where we are. There's, there's some things I talked to Mayor Hardy over in Kenston today, and um, <clears throat> I guess we'll have some more things maybe for the retreat to talk with about this, you think? I'm happy to discuss with whatever the board wants to, but I need to know tonight so we can prepare if the board wants to have certain items they discussed. Uh, we have, we're planning to present, as I said at the last meeting, uh, our department overview and vision, uh, department by department, like you've asked us to do in the past. Uh, only two items that the board has brought up that we have prepared for, uh, that we plan on discussing. Uh, Mary's gonna bring up the kiosk at the CAPS office and potentially options for utility payments and the board's uh, desire to move forward with some uh, plans like that. And then also plans for uh, cemeteries and uh, cemetery mausoleums. We, we <coughs> discussed that uh, in length several times and we just need to decide if that's a okay. vision that the board has. But that's okay. the only two items we have. So if the board has other items, like I asked the last meeting, if you've got other items, we need to know so we can be prepared. Well, we, we do want to talk about the internet some more. Okay. Um, anybody else have any more new business at this time? Do we need a closed session tonight? Yes, sir, Mayor. We need, uh, uh, need to have a brief closed session to uh, discuss a personnel matter and uh, the potential acquisition of real property pursuant to 143, 1311A5, and A6. <clears throat> so moved. Second. Motion to second. Is there a discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion to say aye. 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 Mayor, can I make a motion to close the uh, meeting? Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. All right. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting tonight. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion to say aye. 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 The meeting is adjourned. Good night. Bye.